This is Earth, our home planet. Lots of water and a little bit of land. Since we have been looking at the sky towards the stars, we kept wondering, how did this happen? How did Earth appear? How did it evolve? Where does the water come from? Where, how did life appear? So curiosity has been the driver of mankind to ask questions and look for answers, and science has been our guide. We built experiments, becoming increasingly complex, and we kept interpreting the results, trying to make sense of what we saw. And we find ourselves the results of an apparently unique cosmic experiment, because we haven't found life anywhere else yet. So, trying to understand how this worked, we wanted to understand what were the initial conditions that led ultimately to the formation of Earth and the solar system, because were maybe these conditions so unique that we were the only possible outcome? Or maybe these physical conditions were not that unique and rather common in, this, in the galaxy, in the universe, and in this case, we might not be alone after all. But this is a key question. How did this all start? The solar system at the very beginning was not a peaceful place. It was actually a very violent place. It started out of a gas, a cloud of gas and dust collapsing under the action of its own gravity. Pressure and temperature reached such high values at the center of the cloud that at some point the nuclear burning of hydrogen started. The sun was born. Out of the debris circling around the newborn star, the planet formed. Originally, small grains of dust accreting slowly toward bigger and bigger bodies until they reach their final size that we see today. But in fact, during this violent process, during all this heating, crushing, heating that happened, most of the information about our origin just got lost. So how are we going to find material dating back from 4.5 billion of years ago, just from the infancy of the solar system? So we sent fleets of spacecraft across the solar system to study planets, but these bodies have evolved a lot. And we quickly realized that if we want to find clues on our origin, we had to go to places very um, cold, where the temperature was so low that they would have kept intact the information we were looking, from, uh, looking for. This place in the solar system exists. It's called the Kuiper Belt. It's very far from the sun. It's beyond the orbit of Neptune. It's inhabited by hundreds of thousands of small bodies, frozen pieces, just a few kilometers in size of dust and primordial ices. From time to time, one of these bodies is pulled out the outskirts of the solar system by the gravitational pull of the giant planets, and it, 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 it puts on an orbit that brings it regularly much closer to the sun. And there, the sun heat is evaporating the ice and the dust content, generating this million kilometer sized tail that we see sometime from the Earth's sky. This is called a comet. Comets have been long for a very long time, but they were once feared. Their appearance was feared as messenger of death and destruction by the, by the superstitious mankind. And in fact, it's not until the age of space exploration where we could build spacecraft that we were able to resolve the tiny nucleus at the center of a comet tail, because it was otherwise too small and too dark to be seen from, um, from Earth using telescopes. With Rosetta, we wanted the ultimate challenge. We wanted to be able to land on such a nucleus. Previous mission has just flown by. We wanted to land on it, and we wanted to be able to follow this nucleus of the comet around, uh, on a journey around the sun. So we embarked on a 10 years journey. It didn't take 10 years because uh, the comet was far or because we got lots in space. I get this question quite often. Actually, no. You remember, we want to land on the comet, and for this, you need to have a slow velocity with respect to your target. So all these 10 years were used to catch, to, to catch up with the comet, to gain velocity. And on this trip, Mars and Earth helped us, a bit like gravitational slingshots. Every time we were passing by, they were, the planets were giving up a bit of their speed and making us get closer to our target. And I recall 11 years ago, I was a student in, in physics, and at that time, I woke up um, very early to be able to watch the start because I really wanted to witness this historical moment. It got postponed a few times, but every time I would go because I really wanted to be there when it would start. 
And I was really not imagining at that time, really not, that someday I would have the big chance to be, to be part of this project. And we had to go so far from the sun in order to catch our comet that we had to put the spacecraft in a deep hibernation mode. Then you switch off everything, you keep only the most vital system, and you wait until you're getting closer to the sun. And that's why in January 2014, we had to wake up the spacecraft. It was a very, very tense moment, because if the spacecraft would not have woken up, then there would have been no mission even before it started. But as you can see, this little peak on the radio signal from the probe sent from millions of kilometers away that took 25 minutes to travel with light, light time, the spacecraft was alive and we could start our mission. We still had, in March 2014, we still had 5 million kilometers to go and the comet, our target, was just a little dot in the field of view of the camera. And this is a point where we started to think that how will our comet really look like? We had made so far guesses, educated guesses, as you call it, um, based on observation from Earth made with telescopes, mathematical models of how our comet would look like. But our guesses turned out to be completely wrong. In July 2014, it was a moment like, hey, wait a minute, why does, it look, does the comet look like that? It was made of two parts. This was completely unexpected, and you can imagine how more difficult it would make the landing on the comet. So, at least we thought, okay, the comet doesn't look like we expected, but hopefully the surface will be smooth. And this is what we saw. It was not smooth at all, the surface was extremely rough. This would make the landing even more complicated. So, we had 60 days to choose a safe place for landing let's say more an interesting place for landing, because to choose your, your landing site, you should be, it should be scientifically interested, it should be well illuminated in order to recharge the battery of the lander, and it should also be in good view of the orbiter in order to relay the data. Finally, the landing site was selected and the uh, process of landing could begin. This illustrates a bit how the landing was planned at exactly the right time. You had to give exactly the right push to the Philae um, lander in order for it to reach exactly the point you wanted to land on. And I must say, it was in um, November last year, it went quite well. We made a few pictures, we said goodbye to our lander before sending him to the unknown and, in fact, it touched down exactly where it was predicted. So, people starting to cheer up. I was there with these guys. It was a fantastic moment. And very quickly, something weird. It was clear that something weird was happening, because the lander was still moving. And this could mean only one thing, that the anchoring mechanism had failed. This was one of, the, this was one of our horror scenario. We were bouncing back off the surface of the comet to space. So we went back up 1,000 meters of altitude, then we bounced twice more, and we finally landed in a shadowed area against a rock. Just after the landing, the nominal mission of Rosetta started. You remember our big goals to be able to study the coma of a comet, to catch material from the early solar system. We have 11 instruments on board just doing that, scrutinizing the surface of the comet at all possible wavelengths, from infrared to UV, and even catching small dust grains that the comet is releasing and uh, sniffing the gas that the comet is uh, also releasing. And this is actually my, the main part of my job currently, is to provide the best condition, viewing condition for all instruments. So we are flying a complicated pattern of trajectories in order for our experiment to be performed in the best conditions. And we have learned a lot already. The surface turned out to be a dream for geologists. The landscape is just wonderful. When you see these pictures, you can only find them wonderful. We have peaks of mountains. We have smooth plains covered by dust. We have cliffs. We have also a very dry surface. That was unexpected. We don't see all these patches of water ice that were expected, and it can only mean once it, that actually this ice is just below the surface. For the first time also, we were able to see the detail of how the coma of a comet is forming, how the tail is forming, how the gas is distributed when it gets vaporized by the sun's heat. 
And we see a much more complicated pattern than we could imagine before. We see that it's linked to the comet rotation in particular. And it's absolutely not homogeneous. The gas is being released in jets of dust and gas whose origin on the surface could be traced by our instruments. Rosetta will keep watching the comet in the coming months. It will keep monitoring its increase of activity as it gets closer to the Sun until it reaches the closest point in uh, August this year. Then we will be um, uh, staying with the comet as it gets back to the far region of the solar system until uh, midsummer next year. For me, this mission is really the fulfillment of a student's dream. I really want it, just even a little bit, be contributing to the advancement of mankind's knowledge. And more generally, we should probably change the way we see um, knowledge acquisition. At a time where everything is being judged by its financial value, by its return on investment, I think we should rediscover knowledge for its own sake. So that's why today my main message to you would be keep curious, keep wondering, keep questioning, and do what it takes to find the answers. Thank you.